So I must admit, I was a little bit surprised when I was approached by Alison to speak, uh, but then soon understood that the people behind this event are looking to push the profession forward, and maybe something about what I am trying to do in the architecture profession can somehow give some hints as to where we might be going. So I hope I'll be able to say a few things to that end, even though I'm not from your profession. So I'm an architect, as I said, and my journey to this point began about 15 years ago as a bit of an unconventional architecture student. Um, I was much more interested in, the, in how design affects behavior than just how it looks. And it led me to projects like this, uh, like building a fake door uh, overnight in a department and seeing what effect it had on people. Obviously, it was shocking. Uh, or I built, for example, a fake crossing request box and hanging it in places where there were no crossings. So unfortunately, no one used uh, the one I attached to the tree. But people did start using waiting to cross where there was no crossing, all because that box signaled to them that they could. In hindsight, that was probably illegal and dangerous, but it was fun at the time. Um, and I wanted to know why I was interested in using behavioral facets like empathy or curiosity as design tools, but others around me were driven to focus on form. Why is it that seeing firsthand that how design shapes behavior, was it not the primary driver for how we work as a profession? This was before I'd heard of Jan Gell or Johanny Palazma, who became inspirations to continue this line of inquiry. These are the questions that have driven my work since and have led me to develop a new kind of design practice, one driven by behavioral neuroscience and a science-informed methodology. I would like to talk about design as a profession and share with you a few perspectives on how, how all of the professions that deal with design are about to experience a paradigm shift. I'm going to use architecture as the main source of examples, and of course, light is part of architecture, and I hope you'll be able to draw those parallels to your work, even though I'm not from your profession. Our shared forms of communication are crucial for us to express intent. Even small differences can make huge changes, and without them, we'd have no way of agreeing how to operate together in the world. If you want to explain to someone what you want to get built, how do you do it? How do we communicate ideas to one another and arrive at agreed upon expectations? In architecture, you can refer to Neufert or the metric handbook, it's kind of like the Bible, for guidance on measurements. And they're understandably usually based on the relationship between our bodies and space. This is how we can relate to our shared world through its physicality and objective measures that we can understand as universally as possible. So throughout history, people have used different systems of measurements, sometimes based on our bodies or derived from specific objects or perceived qualities. These, these measurements aren't just our common language, they profoundly shape the way we think. Because intuitively, if it's measurable, then it exists. But Einstein picked up on a problem that this creates. If how and what we measure both facilitates and limits the way we evaluate the world around us, do they truly reflect the importance of things? He stated that not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. But what can be counted ends up shaping our environment. Whatever can be added to a design brief that we can evaluate them as a measure of success tends to be the driver of design decisions. What can be counted becomes the engine for optimization and the evolution of design. Sometimes the changes are slow and gradual, but other times they're changes we can all perceive. So we all have seen the shrinking of airplane seats in front of our eyes over the years. That's because the measures driving the evolution of this design in this case, passenger numbers and profit. But this process affects everything. Our streets have had meaning engineered out of them for the sake of efficiency, the efficiency of movement, the efficiency of maintenance costs, and also at times to avoid people dwelling in them. In London especially, 
but in many other cities, dwelling in streets is discouraged and frowned upon, barely supported by the design, supposedly because it doesn't answer to the metrics attached to it. But considering the types of metrics that shape our environment, I would say that often architecture exists in the sacrifice of efficiency. By that, I mean that we might find that focusing on human needs may well mean the sacrifice of the traditional metrics that have been guiding us for centuries. After all, efficiency is for machines, not for the complex needs of people. If the future of design is people-centered, we're going to need to rethink our guiding metrics completely. Yet we're still drawn to beauty and to the intangible vibe of a place. We can love spaces that by today's standards on paper would not be commissioned or approved. And we can hate places that fit every requirement made. We rarely talk about these qualities because it's almost embarrassing to be anything other than technical. And to talk about the ephemeral makes you a hippie. But then we also look on dismayed at the state of everyday architecture. Why is it that we are drawn to places that inspire that make us feel a sense of belonging, that bring awe and curiosity into our lives. But we rarely talk about aspiring to design for these same qualities. Why is it when facing a client, anything other than efficiency is seen as a luxury? Could it be that the traditional metrics that tend to poorly reflect the human experience that architecture exists actually in the sacrifice of those metrics. This photo shows a famous example that's used to talk about the celebration of functionality. It's in the Bauhaus School, part of the movement that led to the perception of buildings as machines for living in. This specific radiator was placed high up on the wall, as if to say that beauty, that the beauty of its functionality is akin to art. But I'd like to suggest a different interpretation. The radiator was elevated to art in the sacrifice of its functionality and efficiency. It took on new value because it became harder to use. So how can we perceive what was gained from this sacrifice? For me, this is the role of science for architecture and design, to help us understand all the invisible, hidden values some of the values that you, as designers, may know intuitively, but are often dismissed simply as taste. The first thing to say about science is that science is not suddenly going to grow arms and hands and sit at your desk and design. What science can do is shift design from efficient to effective. Through new knowledge, we are going to see a transition in how people assign value to space and to your work. Science can push design to bring it more in line with the real interest of designers, making good spaces for people. And it's already happening. Research in psychology and neuroscience are well into their way to creating the foundations of understanding the relationship between environment and many facets of the human experience. And they're also giving us the tools to comprehend and measure things that have previ previously gone unmeasured in the building industry. We are adding new metrics, human metrics, that can quantify the hidden value of good design. But in the meantime, you can look at the kind of effect that human metrics can represent, behavioral, physiological, cognitive, mental. If anyone has figured this out, this slide has a mistake. Do you know what it is? Anyone in the front? Spock is actually a rational being, so most of these things don't act, are not relevant to him. But human metrics can also relate to different scales and time frames, such as looking at the effects of individuals all the way to society. It may seem like a long time for all this new academic knowledge to reach industry, but there are a few good analogies to help us see what's coming. Take, for example, a product like cigarettes. In the past, it was marketed through visuals, glamorizing smoking. 
The effect of health were originally not well known, and so this was not considered in its consumption. Until the evidence became too hard to ignore, and action had to be taken in order to balance the product and its real impact. We have a similar process occurring in foods. Our consumption habits are changing because our awareness is changing. Supply and demand are affected at times by market forces, but also collective awareness and cultural shifts. Architecture is going through a similar process. One way of spotting this is looking at information coming out of mainstream media. And here are examples of the coverage on the effects of architecture and urban design on health. The first three examples are examples from the Conscious Cities, the, the Conscious Cities movement, which I lead. We have events and publications, and we push out this kind of knowledge into collective awareness. The last example, uh, the Metro, is, um, is interesting because Metro is, uh, is a newspaper that's giving out in the underground metro in London, so it has a really wide readership. And people pick this up and they see something like sick building syndrome. So sick building syndrome, as an example, defined as a condition affecting office workers, typically marked by headaches and breathing problems, attrib attributed to unhealthy or stressful factors in the working environment, such as poor ventilation. Remember that if we can't measure it, then it doesn't exist. But now that it's beginning to be measurable, how is it going to change the way we consume architecture? The biophilia movement is a good case study for this kind of shift and an excellent example of how today's society approaches values. For the last few decades, research has been trickling through about the role of nature in health. Biophilia says that natural stimuli have a benefit to our well-being. And this has eventually permeated collective awareness and is now affecting design decisions. The pattern is clear, and it's already affecting mo the most competitive markets because those wishing to produce the best environments have new tools to evaluate their progress. Competitiveness is taking on a new form. So how, does, how else does collective awareness shape the industry? The green building movement, as a continuation of biophilia, has shown that demand can shape supply in architecture. For many designers, a client's demand for a BREAM or LEED certification has very direct impact on the perceived value of their work. This is being followed up by newer initiatives that are doing the same for well-being. Take the Well Building Institute, for example. It's one of many initiatives, let's call it institutionalizing the knowledge about architecture and health and feeding back into our constantly evolving collective awareness. Awareness that designers can't afford to ignore any longer. In the most competitive markets, like office space, developers who are interested in future-proofing their portfolio have realized that to keep their properties relevant, they have to know how to think to satisfy tenants in the long term. And what will this mean for the field of light? Most of you will have already heard of photoreceptors, rods and cones, which feed the visual system. In 2007, researchers showed that humans have, have also photoreceptors that have non-image forming functions, like controlling circadian rhythms. It shows that biologically, light isn't just part of vision, our bodies are hardwired to receive cues from levels of light. We need to start designing with recognition that we are permeating the minds of others and affecting their lives profoundly. Here are a few clues to understand just a little about the effects of light on health, which many of you might already know. Circadian disruption, as an example, is associated with a number of negative health effects, including the effects of, on mood, metabolism, and the immune system. One example of collective awareness shaping supply are the known effects of blue light on com coming at us from technology. We're changing our consumption habits too, for example, by limiting screen time before bed or filtering out blue light. But it's not just about cues for our biological functions. Light, as part of our visual experience, also has significant effect on our emotional response. So you might be asking, how will this affect me? How will it affect my work? Well, people are going to start expecting a whole lot more from design. 
What's another driver for change? Let's not go down that route. One way of looking at what's on the menu for human-centered design is by referring to Maslow's pyramid. It can help us think about how design can answer its different levels. I think it's best to use Maslow's pyramid not as an understanding of uh, the importance of needs, but actually a scale of needs that begin at the bottom as those that are more universal and shared between us and rise up to the more subjective. So for example, we all need safety and food. Our social needs tend to vary from person to person, and our idea of self-actualization is extremely subjective and varies wildly. As we rise up in subjectivity, we get needs and wants that perhaps can be addressed in more personal spaces, but they generally don't make it into architectural or design briefs. Rarely will a client ask for a space that fosters friendships, but in reality, the value of our input as designers do also tend to target these outcomes. It's difficult to imagine how we can address all these needs at once since we know that despite all the new technology and methods to measure the human experience, we're talking about something incredibly complex. One way to start breaking down, or at least how we work at Hume, is by using a simple tool. We do this through a user affordance space formula to help create a thesis that is specific enough to probe scientifically. By looking at the relationship of these three elements, we can create insights to improve the outputs of spaces. But even when we talk about measurement, it gets messy pretty quickly. Think about the fact that despite being able to measure certain things objectively, say heart rate or brain activity or eye movement, nothing gets past the fact that perception plays a key role in our experience. Our perception affects how we evaluate our condition. For example, we know that the perceived temperature of a space can change according to the color of light. So really, we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. Let's take, for, for example, interpersonal distance. It affects how we feel about many social situations, and it comes from the field of study called proxemics, for the science of people's proximity to one another. The following are measurements taken from an international study on people's preference for interpersonal distance when they first meet someone. So here we have Eva Peron, she's representing an Argentinian who on average prefer people at 76 centimeter distance when they first meet them. Then Conchita, an Austrian rocks up and stands at her comfort zone, which is 85 centimeters. Eva and Conchita are pretty happy. They both feel that their personal space is respected, but they're close enough to show interest. But then Tarkan, a Turkish pop singer, comes along, and Turks like to keep their distance when meeting someone new, according to this study. He's pulling his moves at a very distant 125 centimeters. So Eva starts to think Tarkan's behaving strangely. She begins to think maybe she smells. Is there something wrong with me, she thinks. Her appraisal of objective measures are different because of perception. The distance is the same distance, but they feel differently about the experience. And of course, preference for interpersonal distance, like most things, changes for different ages and gender. People's perception of what makes a good social interaction is very nuanced. All these parameters are at play when we're trying to predict what the effect of our work, our design, will be on experience. All of these workings out that you are doing intuitively are hidden to those who aren't doing this work. What does all this mean? Well, I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news is we don't have a way of saying, if you do X, Y will happen. We can't really talk about causality. What we talk about are correlations. The good news is, you know what else we trust that works on correlations? Medicine. So if you go to a doctor and you uh, say to him you have a few symptoms, he, looks at, he figures out what you might have, and his medicine won't be 100% sure that it's going to cure what you have. 
But the correlations from research say that it's pretty likely. So he doesn't say, hold up, hold up, we need to wait another 50 years until we're 100% sure. He administers the medicine because that's what research is telling us. The difference in architecture is that we're talking about place. And therefore, the best way of administering medicine is indeed what we call in situ, in place. I made this last night. Um, we do that by making sure that the performance indicator attached, the human metric, is attached to the place. Sorry, I missed something there. Uh, and it will become the measure that will guide the evolution of an environment towards its human goals. Yum. I'll give you an example of where this is already happening. Our changing understanding of intelligence is affecting the way we look at education. So intelligence is no longer just seen as knowledge, it's now seen as our ability to adapt and think creatively. This has given birth to new ways to evaluate the effectiveness of learning environments, and so the metric is reshaping the design of schools. Finland, for example, or Singapore here, change their primary education systems to playful learning based on the research that has shown that guided play can have better learning outcomes for children. This leads school designs to perform differently because the measures of success are different. So it's no longer test scores that we all experienced in a teacher sitting and talking as I am to you. It's actually now creative thinking. How can an environment create the situations by which children develop to think creatively and to solve problems? But even though I'm making an analytical, economic, and sociological case for the paradigm shift the design field's about to experience, and yes, sometimes it's a little bit worrying, I would like us to see the bigger picture. I believe there's a silver lining, and that these changes are going to give the design industry its agency back. Design is a decision-making process, and I'd like to quote one of my inspirations, Upali Nanda, and say that, Every design decision is a hypothesis. When you are creating designs, you are hypothesizing that people will react a certain way to it. And this is where the scientific approach fits best. When we make a hypothesis, we're doing it because we believe that it will produce a certain outcome. And so in order to make sure the hypothesis makes sense, we refer to knowledge that we can find. But science isn't really there to provide concrete answers. It's really there to ask good questions. If we can build on scientific knowledge to make a better hypothesis, our decisions are much more likely to be informed, and very importantly, our work more valued by others. Society's evolving collective awareness means that the intent of both designer and client will be better perceived and understood by others. But to those that mean well, this should be seen as a blessing. Architecture augments our ability to achieve a state we wouldn't have been able to without it. And that extended intent could be to serve a single person or a whole society. But mostly, once that intent has materialized into built form, it stays as is, intent frozen in time for us to interact with. It could be well-meaning or not, but if you start looking at the built world around you in terms of what message it projects, you'll begin to see you're surrounded by the materialization of intent. We would probably agree that designers, on the most part, go into the profession to make a positive impact. But it doesn't always end up that way. Sometimes designers suffer from lacking the means to prove the value of their contribution or their inability of their clients to see it or sadly, by their own inability to put ego aside. But when designers use informed empathy to extend their intent to make a positive impact, the result is design that is intuitively loved and protected by others. Why am I using the word intent? Because we shape the world around us to achieve our intent. It's a way of extending our, out our existence and our values beyond ourselves in order to adapt the world according to them. And here I want to state something about the following slides because I usually talk about architecture. So I talk about building intent in relation to architecture, but the same could be said for light. 
As you see these images, I want you to imagine how the same intent would manifest for light. From the beginnings of architecture, when people moved out of caves and began to build in order to carry out their intent to survive and thrive, to our ability to support our own efforts to overcome challenges, to avoid danger. We use architecture to separate, claim things as our own, and keep others away. But we also use it to welcome and show warmth. We can use architecture to show, that they have been, to show people that they've been thought of and that they are wanted and included. This is a photo during a protest in Tel Aviv at Rabin Square in front of the local municipality building. I use this as an example because Rabin Square was designed with the intention to allow up to 40,000 people to gather in front of the municipality. You can see here the building is lit up in colors to show solidarity with the cause. In the day-to-day, -day, Rabin Square can seem vast and empty, but it's that emptiness that allows the voice of the city's people to be heard. The square intends to empower. In contrast, if you've ever visited Trafalgar Square in London, you will have noticed two huge fountains that look like they were placed there for ornament. However, these two fountains were added to the square in 1845 in order for there to be less space for gathering. This is intent in disguise. Sometimes architecture clashes with our own desires and we answer back by reshaping the world to our needs despite what has been built. As people who shape the environment, what kind of dialogue are we creating with the users of space? Collective awareness will make it easier to perceive design intent. People will soon look at their surroundings differently to discern whether designers, property owners, developers, even city authorities have their well-being in mind. A few weeks ago, I flew over Israel and noticed that the color of streetlights were different in neighboring towns. This is obviously a municipality decision, but the juxtaposition makes you think. A whole population in one town are exposed to white light at night, whilst the other isn't. That means the likely difference in the quality of sleep and therefore health between two neighboring towns. Who will be held responsible when people get smart or when the impact is made visible? So where's the light at the end of the tunnel? First of all, for those who adapt quickly, there's the opportunity to gain a competitive edge. Secondly, there have been very few times in human history where market forces started leaning towards human health. We're about to have the opportunity to be rewarded for leaving a positive mark in the world, perhaps the reason we all went into design in the first place. I'd like to leave you with two questions. The first is from me, and it's simple. How will you build positive intent into the world? My suggestion is to keep on asking questions. If you want to make the value of your work visible, reach out to those who can help you. Work with other disciplines to redefine your work. As this conference continues, we'll be hearing and seeing amazing new things about where the lighting industry is heading. And I think I'd like to leave you with a slightly adapted second statement to keep in mind from Cedric Price. Maybe technology is the answer. But what is the question? Thank you.